All right. I've really been looking forward to this discussion with Dr. Mary Gong. She's a urogynecologist based in the Lower Mainland and practicing right now at Royal Columbian Hospital for the most part. I'll tell you, Mary, how I actually found you. I, a few years ago, was listening. I don't remember how it was organized, but you talked to a bunch of us pelvic health physios about forceps. And you, you know, shared some different visuals and it helped us, us understand what does that process look like. And so I've been wanting to do an episode for a while on the topic of operative vaginal birth, just talking about vacuum and forceps and what does that look like for people? Because as a pelvic health physio, I obviously see people um, during pregnancy or postpartum. And I think a lot of times there's a lot of fear wrapped up with the unknown and a lot of thinking around certain births are not as good as others. And I think it's important to have these conversations just so that people understand all of the different ins and outs and that not one birth is wrong compared to another. I also know that you have a special interest yourself in you've done some, you know, been involved in some research yourself in the area of prevention and management of pelvic floor trauma after childbirth. And just I just thought you were such an engaging person to speak with when we did that little um, lecture. And so I appreciate you saying yes to me today to talk about this topic in more detail on the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Melissa. Yes, I think uh, it was also one of your colleagues uh, who approached me regarding this topic. Uh, trust me, this is a, a topic that probably the most common questions uh, my friends and uh, who are having babies ask me. It's like, what would I choose if I had to choose between, you know, forceps versus vacuum versus C-section, right? Because there's a lot of kind of uh, different studies may have different information that's provided to patients. So it's very, very confusing uh, in the situation. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to uh, chat with the audience uh, about this topic. Will you just share a little bit more about yourself? I want people to be able to picture kind of who you are, but then also what kind of setting do you work in so that people understand that about you? Of course, yeah. So basically, I did all my training in BC. Um, I did my uh, residency at uh, uh, UBC, that's the five year for OBGYN, obstetrics and gynecology. Um, after that, um, I did two years of fellowship in uh, pelvic floor health and reconstruction at St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver. Um, so I had the pleasure of working with many of the urogynecologists um, uh, in the lower mainland. Um, just to kind of clarify, what's the difference between a urogynecologist and a general gynecologist? Uh, the urogynecologists uh, focus a bit more on uh, the pelvic floor um, because we deal with uh, a lot of uh, kind of uh, things um, that sometimes it's a result of childbirth and pregnancies, uh, such as uh, incontinence uh, when you cough and sneeze. Um, uh, sometimes people get pelvic floor, again, prolapse, um, and then other people, they just really have a bad healing from their uh, childbirth that we do help with them um, with these uh, issues. So that's what my specialty is. And, and then, yes, I did some research, especially in obstetrical anal sphincter injuries, uh, which is one of the uh, topics that we're going to discuss today as well. So, um, yes, I am uh, very interested in this topic, and I hope I can um, help shed some light uh, on this topic, but uh, there's a lot of information that uh, I know we won't be able to cover today. So, Of course. And I think like I'm putting on this, the spot a little bit with this, but I think I'm always surprised actually when I reach out to people like yourself that I know are very busy, I expect people to say, Melissa, I don't have time. <laughs> And mm -hmm. I understand when people say that. Can you share a little bit, like, what makes you passionate about this? Like, why did you even say yes in the first place? Do you feel that information is limited? Do you feel like it's hard to get information across? And one of the reasons I do this podcast, to be honest, is share information with the masses. And I always mm -hmm. say to the people I'm interviewing, I would like this to be something you'd want to share with your clients. Because otherwise, I think sometimes we have a lot of these discussions one on one with our mm -hmm. clients. And I like the idea of kind of mass information so that people can listen to it. But I'm curious, like, why did you say yes to this? Yeah, so your goal. The, the reason I love to talk about this topic is because I really 
want to decrease the amount of anxiety and fear around childbirth, right? Because imagine you're pregnant for the first time and you hear your friends having all these tears and trauma. And, you know, this is not something you want to go into a, a pregnancy and a birth experience with. So I think, um, you know, having some information um, about um, these are the things that could happen. And this is how you can um, uh, use to decide what kind of birth you want. I think this information is helpful and help kind of really uh, alleviate some of the anxiety going into this birth experience. So that's why I, I'm happy to talk about it. I appreciate it. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I sometimes, and and I've heard the term before, um, operative vaginal birth. And so I, I think that encompasses forceps, vacuum. Um, does that also encompass, would that consider like a episiotomy too? Like anything that requires intervention? I think that's kind of under that umbrella term. Yeah, of course. So basically, um, in, in terms of vaginal births, um, the big categories are kind of spontaneous vaginal birth, which means that there is no assistance. The mother's uh, effort is all that's required to give birth to the baby. And then anything that requires a little bit of help from the healthcare provider, um, it's usually considered to be more operative. But under the the FOGC guidelines, operative vaginal birth is mainly the vacuum and then the forceps delivery. But I do consider the episiotomy as part of the assistance as well. And then you have the surgical birth, which is the C-section. So for someone that's, you know, only listening to this, can you describe, would you describe forceps and vacuum? Sure. Yeah. So basically uh, a vacuum is, um, it's a little suction cup um, that uh, creates a suction so it can um, um, attach to the baby's head. So when there's situations where the baby needs to be delivered right away, oftentimes this is because the baby's heart rate is not good. So then we can use that in addition to the mother's help because the mother has to push really hard as well to deliver the baby more quickly. So it's more uh, a little suction cup that goes on the baby's head. Um, forceps, um, they are, um, I usually describe to patients as uh, they're solid, solid tongs <laughs> that goes around the baby. Uh, yes, they're made of metal because um, um, sometimes we do need to uh, use a little bit more power in those situations uh, compared to a, um, a, a vacuum. Uh, because um, sometimes uh, babies are uh, a little bit bigger or sometimes they're not uh, as low as um, some of the babies that can be delivered with vacuum. So forceps also come in play in certain situations where we feel that um, the vacuum are not going to be able to deliver the baby successfully. So the solid tongs um, are going to go around the baby's head. And again, it's to help us uh, um, guide the baby out of the birth canal uh, in addition to the mother pushing. What are some of the reasons then, like, let's say you're, and and I don't know that you'd be in there yet in the, in the, you yourself would be in the birth room or the operative room yet, or whatever Mm -hmm. the setting is, what would be some of the reasons then why that would be indicated? So what would be going on that Mm -hmm. the provider would think that they need to move to that intervention? Yeah, so um, some of the there's um, um, some medical indications um, um, for this. So when the mom has conditions where they should not be pushing for a long time, so uh, this can include um, if they have severe cardiac disease, where pushing for a long time can can be quite dangerous. Um, some women have respiratory disease, um, and then other women also have malformation of the blood vessels in their brain where this just the pushing and the increase in pressure will be quite dangerous for the mother. So in those situations, we may need to help the mother um, uh, to deliver the baby so they're not pushing, let's say, for three hours or more. Okay, so that's one of the common indications. Um, another possibility is, like I mentioned before, is when the baby's heart rate is not good um, and um, the baby is almost delivered, but we just don't have the extra, let's say, 15 minutes or 30 minutes to let the mother push the baby out. Uh, our concern is usually there's not enough oxygen delivered to the baby and we are worried that the baby may have brain damage. So then that situation where we're going to offer the help. Um, and then um, the final possibility or the final most common uh, common theme is that they've been pushing for many, many hours, let's say three hours, four hours, and there's no progress. And mother is exhausted and they have no more energy to push the baby out. Then we'll also offer the help. And how would you then, what would be some reasons that maybe um, 
that maybe like, how do you decide when to do that versus a c-section i mean i know some of that would be a discussion with mom you know and, and preferences but are there are there other reasons why in some ways a c-section might be um the choice of course yeah so basically um the the main kind of thing uh, um way we decide between an operative vaginal birth and a c-section is which one has the least risk right because a c-section is a major surgery and it's not risk-free um so i can give you one example so if the woman has been pushing for about three to four hours the baby is really low on the perineum and you can see a little bit of the head already in those situations um, yes, forceps are like, well, we can talk about the different risks uh, between forceps, vacuum, and C-section. But those situations, um, if we go for a C-section, it's going to have, it's going to be a very difficult C-section because imagine that the baby is already close to the vaginal opening. It's almost for delivery. You have to bring this baby all the way back up through the abdomen and deliver the baby. There's a high risk of having a tear in the cervix because now the cervix is fully dilated and the baby's head is low. And if you do result in a cervical tear with a C-section, they have a risk of incompetent cervix in their future pregnancies, which means that they have a high risk of having preterm birth, which has a lot of other complications. So the C-section is definitely not always the best option. So, yeah. So can you talk a little bit about risks? What are some of the risks associated with vacuum and forceps? Yeah. So in terms of the, um, so let's talk about vacuum first, because um, uh, this one, um, many of the studies suggest that it's a little bit lower risk compared to the forceps delivery. So um, in terms of, um, we always talk about mother, risk to the mother and risk to the baby. So risk to the mother with operative delivery is that there's always a little bit higher risk of uh, lacerations in the vagina or higher risk of having an obstetrical anal sphincter injury. The main reason for that is they're just an, an extra instrument in the vagina to help deliver the baby. So you need a little bit extra room. Uh, of course, any type of operative de uh, delivery does have a little bit higher risk of having a postpartum bleeding. Um, this is not usually just a result of the, vagin uh, the operative delivery because in those situations, oftentimes there's, um, you know, mother has been pushing for a long time. The uterus is really tired. So there's many other factors why um, uh, uh, there's more bleeding after these births, right? Um, also, um, the operative deliveries does have a higher risk of having um, encountering shoulder dystocia. Shoulder dystocia is when the baby's head is delivered, but the shoulder is a bit too wide and gets stuck behind the pelvic bone. The reason for that is basically for ladies who pushed for a long time, the baby's not coming. There's a high chance this is a really big baby. So the shoulder dystocia is not as a result of the operative delivery. It's just one of the risk factors that you are going to encounter if you need to help a woman to deliver their baby. Okay. Um, and then finally, um, operative delivery also have a higher risk of uh, kind of more long-term effect on the woman. So those are the incontinence. Um, the prolapse, um, and then um, some of the pelvic floor weakness that that I, I'm sure you deal with and see a mm -hmm. lot of women in your clinic for, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that those are the most common kind of maternal risks. Mm -hmm. uh, for fetal risks, um, there is always a chance, for instance, with vacuum, um, there's a chance of having a little hematoma where the vacuum is attached. Um, these are very low risk. They're usually less, always less than 5%. Um, with forceps delivery, sometimes you will see a little bit of bruising on the face, which are temporary. Facial nerve injuries are very, very rare, where the forceps will push on the baby's face a little bit too much, so they get a little droopy face on one side, but they will resolve spontaneously. Um, so, and then of course, you if you look on Google and all these terrible stories, the really rare things like fetal skull fractures, yes, it's possible, but with my many years of practice and uh, even with my colleagues, I just have not heard of one, but then it's possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. We warn patients about that. So I think the main thing is, um, is, you know, go with the provider who, who are experienced in performing these procedures and then trust what their recommendation is, because uh, there's a lot of things that we consider before we offer a operative vaginal delivery. And obviously short term, like, would you see, 
I mean, I, you can't really generalize this, but would you say generally, um, <laughs> you can't generalize, but would you say generally, like acutely, some of these women would have perhaps, you know, more swelling, more, you know, more chance of tearing, um, you know, more edema, more pain. Like, would you, would you kind of expect those people to feel that acutely a little bit more? I mean, not necessarily, but. Yeah. So um, basically I think the, the issue with operative delivery is because I see all these studies saying all this trauma and bleeding and tearing. The the issue with them is because there are many of the studies it doesn't consider all the other factors that resulted in this vaginal operative delivery, right? Like, let's say if this woman pushed for four hours, she's going to be more edematous than a woman who only pushed for an hour, right? She's probably going to have a bigger baby than the woman who delivered vaginally without any assistance. Uh, she may be older than a woman, a younger woman who pushed this out. So there's many other maternal factors or even other things that even happened before the operative vaginal delivery that contributed to the more bleeding, more pain, more tearing. Now, of course, whenever we put extra instrument in the vagina, yes, it's going to cause a little bit more trauma than just a spontaneous vaginal birth. So um, if the question is, could it cause more? Yes. But is it the only reason why they have more tear and more swelling? I don't think so. I think there's many other factors that contribute to it. Makes perfect sense. Mary, uh, you're, you yourself, are you ever assisting births or are you more someone that's kind of involved after the fact in some of the long-term complications? Yeah. So then, uh, yes, I do deliveries. So basically at Royal Columbian Hospital, I'm on call twice a month. Um, usually I'll deliver on average about uh, six to seven babies per shift. And because we are only consultants at Royal Columbia Hospital, so the only reason they will call me is for operative vaginal delivery. <laughs> so <laughs> that's it's the only reason I would be called. I do not get involved with spontaneous vaginal birth. And so when you're doing, like if you're doing a vacuum or forceps birth, do you always, well, I think maybe this would happen more with forceps, correct me if I'm wrong, but is there always an episiotomy involved? No. So yeah, that's a good question. And then um, the patients will ask me too when I walk into their room. So basically, according to the SOGC, which is the uh, Canadian um, uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology um, uh, Association, um, they do not recommend a routine episiotomy um, in uh, vaginal birth. But there are studies that suggest if we have to perform an operative vaginal birth, in particular forceps, in a woman who never had babies before, um, it can be used to prevent a tear into the sphincter that closes the anal uh, opening. Okay, so I think um, uh, for me how to determine whether I, I need it, it really depends on what I, uh, my assessment is when the baby is starting to crown. So crowning means that the head start to um, come out of the vaginal opening. If I feel that there was a lot of tightness and there's a very high chance that the woman will tear uh, into the muscle that closes off the anal opening, then I will tell the woman that I will need to perform an episiotomy to prevent that. So this is part of my um, consent process before I perform the operative vaginal birth. And so what's the process for, what do you find then when you, let's say it's yourself, because I think it's hard for you to speak for other people, but when it's you mm -hmm. yourself, you know, helping in the delivery and you kind of, it's, you've, some of those criteria have been met, you know, we've been here a while, mom's tired. There's some, um, something on the monitor that's showing that I'm starting to feel a little bit apprehensive with this going longer and you bring it up to mom, you know, this would you say that you bring it up as um, this is what's going on? Um, these are our options. Mm -hmm. Would you say that most people are coming in educated about that, that they they know that this this might happen? Or do you find that mm -hmm. you're having to spend most of that education time in the delivery suite? Mm -hmm. So um, I would say majority of the patients have gone into uh, to the prenatal classes, which has been helpful. That gives them some basic information about the different types of delivery that could happen. Of course, that there are uh, a small percentage of the patients just never heard of any of the things that I would recommend. Um, but even for the women who have uh, some information about the birth uh, options, I think the main thing that, that I see is fear. 
So they say, oh, I heard this is terrible. You know, it's, I, I think it's just, there's a lot of fear around any type of vacuum and forceps. And the patient nowadays are leaning more towards requesting a C-section. They just don't want to entertain it. Even though in certain situations, like I mentioned, that the C-section is actually more risky than an operative vaginal birth. So that's why you know, I think the, I'm so happy you're doing podcasts such as this to give pe- people a different perspective a bit more information other than the really really scary stories they're going to look up on google right so um yeah the so basically the short answer is that i think patients are more educated now but i don't know if they're getting the 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 right information to help them make that correct decision exactly and i that's kind of leads me very nicely to what i kind of wanted to that's one of the reasons i wanted to do this is because I do find in a lot of the education or work that I'm doing with people in pregnancy, um, you know, I bring that up. I bring that up just saying, like, have you talked to your provider about some of the different options? And people are quick to say, I'm, I don't want forceps or I don't want vacuum. And and I think some there's a lot of media attention now because I'm being drawn or I'm being told of my clients will share with me, oh, I heard this on CBC or I heard um, some of this research coming out saying that um, forceps delivery causes trauma. And so if I could just, if we could kind of pick apart some of these messages, because I think it's creating a lot of black and white information, like this is good, this is bad. And, um, I know, so let's just kind of go back and forth with some of these comments. I know, for example, like one of the people that's doing a lot of research in this area, I think from McMaster is Julia Maraca. And Mm -hmm. she recently, one of the studies that I have been told about lately just has to do with um, maternal and neonatal trauma following operative vaginal birth. And I think one of the things that's getting mentioned is that Canada has some of the highest rates of obstetric, uh, obstetrical trauma. And, and I think that's, what's getting a lot of media attention and people are saying, oh my gosh, I don't want to be one of those numbers. Mm -hmm. What, like, I know there are so many reasons why we might have higher rates, but um, I've heard that they're going down, but C-section rates are going up. And I'm just curious to know a little bit about that. Why are our rates high? Yeah, so I think um, some of the reports, so this is something that I have been following. It's the uh, so OECD reports. These are reports of the... uh, um, many of the um, uh, countries uh, where they have um, good data on um, what are some of the pelvic floor trauma from vaginal birth and what are the rate of operative delivery. So even uh, in, I would say in the past 10 years, unfortunately, yes, Canada did come up as one of the higher, uh, the, the countries with the higher rates. But the issue with um, this is that um, there's many things that's um, not considered in in just looking at this number, right? Because um, as we see with our population is that so we are seeing older women mm-hmm. who are having baby for the first time. We are seeing um, mothers who have increasing in BMI, oftentimes due to gestational diabetes. Um, and then we also seeing uh, more multiples um, this is due to IVF pregnancies and assisted pregnancies. So there, are, so there's multiple factors. The other um, kind of pos- possibility is basically what's the definition of pelvic floor trauma? How is this diagnosed? Because um, sometimes, depending on where you are, because we did, a, I did also a um, um, elective when I was a fellow in the UK with their, their pelvic floor clinics there who only, uh, they only treat um, pelvic floor trauma um, after, uh, after um, vaginal birth. And then sometimes they say, if we diagnose these um, injuries using ultrasound, the rate is going to go up because you just see more injuries compared to just diagnosing with your finger or eyeballs. So of course, better diagnostic uh, uh, equipment and, uh, um, um, and then, the the if the definition of these change and of course there's going to be more diagnosis of these pelvic floor traumas yeah mm-hmm. so those are I think are the contributing factors why we're seeing these numbers are higher in Canada and I'm sure that's why we see c-section rates higher too right some of the same factors right just yeah. around with maternal is- advancing maternal age and multiples yeah. and yeah 
Yeah, and then also the most common um, kind of reasons for a C-section is a repeat C-section. Mm -hmm. And then in the past, I think perhaps um, there are more women who are choosing to undergo a trial vaginal birth after previous C-section. Mm -hmm. So for instance, let's say the first baby, they had an abnormal fetal heart rate in delivery. So they needed an emergency C-section. But then the second time they're pregnant, they are technically eligible for a vaginal birth if there are certain criteria that's met. The most common criteria is that they have to be at least 18 months apart from their previous C-section to the next delivery. So, but then when we talk to patients about what are some of the a possible risk of undergoing a vaginal birth after previous C-section. Many women feel even that very, very tiny risk to the to the baby is not acceptable and they'd rather just have a repeat C-section. So we're seeing a lot of repeat C-sections um, that's happening as well. So that's also contributing to the, to the higher C-section rate. I've also heard like in some of these different, let's say podcasts or this, there was this one CBC interview, I think that was, brought to my attention and and they were talking about how um you know the fact that their forceps used to be used a lot and we're trying to bring those numbers down because um we see that there can be a little bit more you know pelvic floor trauma after using something like forceps so i think okay we learned that so let's bring those rates down um mm-hmm. and that because they're doing less and those um, practitioners are retiring, it's just not being used much. And mm-hmm. we're not learning about it as much. I heard that, you know, you just don't mm-hmm. learn, you don't do as many cases as a young physician or whatever. So you're not, you're not maybe using that tool as much. And so I think maybe the comfort might not be there. So it's, it feels more comfortable to do a C-section, but the C-section rates go up. I think there's a lot of, seems like a lot of different things at play there that we try Mm -hmm. to bring one thing down, but then something else goes Mm -hmm. up because there needs to be another intervention. Yeah. So uh, because I I did all my training in BC, so I can't speak on behalf of other provinces, but um, from, because right now I'm training the next generation of residents, they come through our rotation. I trained here, at least in BC, I don't think um, the um, training for operative vaginal deliveries has decreased. Mm. because we use them quite a bit and then um, uh, we get the trainees involved um, as long as the patient give consent, right? Of course, we have to hopefully train people in a safe manner. So then, um, so for at least residents that are trained in BC, they should be quite competent with both vacuums and forceps. Um, I cannot speak on behalf of other provinces. Um, Yes, there are some locations depending on train perhaps you're a bit more comfortable using a vacuum versus forceps um and then um um yeah so i think um as a provider they will offer you what they feel most comfortable with i think Mm -hmm. which is also a bet the best way to practice because then you're going to do the safest thing for the patients Mm -hmm. So as for the providers from BC, I don't think training is the reason why the C-section rate is going up because they should be all quite well trained for both types of uh, operative deliveries. And I think too, one of those, one of the points was just that, because I think that, I think one of the points in the episode that I was listening to is that that um, this woman was saying, I didn't understand the long-term complications of having forceps. And so I think, mm-hmm. um, I think that the point being made was that um, that a vaginal birth is not always, I think people, were, this point was trying to be like, I thought a vaginal birth was my better choice. And I just didn't understand the long-term implications of having the forceps. I wish I would have been offered a C-section. And I can just mm-hmm. imagine that in that moment when, you know, you need to make a, a quick decision and you don't mm-hmm. have the education before as the mom, it's hard to make those educated decisions sometimes, right? And, and I think yeah. too, another point would just be forceps doesn't always mean long-term complications and I think they're kind of being lumped together right is if you have a Mm -hmm. forceps birth you're going to have you're going to have pelvic floor trauma and you're Mm -hmm. going to have fecal incontinence and urinary incontinence and prolapse and I think that it's all being lumped together Um, and there's just a lot of factors involved yeah so basically there are quite a bit of kind of 
uh, studies out there that looked at many different types of uh, oftentimes, you know, the the uh, kind of long term complication of any type of birth, because there are studies that compared what are the rate of pelvic organ prolapse and incontinence after a vaginal birth versus the operative birth versus a C-section. And the interesting finding is that having only C-section, let's say they look at the women who had two C-sections versus somebody who had two vaginal births, it, it, C-section is not protective against pelvic floor disorders. So the women who had two C-sections, they can still have incontinence. They can still have prolapse. It's because carrying a baby for nine months in your abdomen causes a lot of stress on the pelvic floor. So that's why we always encourage women to please see the pelvic floor physiotherapist, even in pregnancy, because all this extra weight stretches out the pelvic floor and can lead to pelvic floor disorder. So the birth, uh, the birth process, yes, it causes injuries, but I think just the overall having a baby will increase your risk of having pelvic floor disruption. So yeah. I think there's a lot of um, different reasons and uh, just having C-section is not protective. And I just want to actually emphasize that C-section is not a benign procedure. Mm -hmm. The long, And then there, there's a lot of long-term complications, again, with C-sections that lots of people don't talk about. Yes, we talk about, yes, any surgery has, you know, bleeding, infection, injury to surrounding structures. But oftentimes our biggest fear with people who had a previous C-section is something called placenta accreta. So this is not something I'm sure it's oftentimes talked about when people are consented for C-section. Accretas are very, very dangerous conditions where the next pregnancy, the placenta implants into the C-section scar and the placenta will not touch from the uterus. And sometimes they can even grow into the bladder and the surrounding organs. These are very, very dangerous because under those situations, the women may need to have the uterus removed at the time of their next C-section. And sometimes they need to have part of the bladder removed if it's attached to the placenta, right? So there are, there are also long-term issues that can happen with C-section. So it's not a benign procedure. Of course not. Um, so I think, I think uh, women also need to factor those in when they're trying to decide what kind of birth they want. Yeah. And I'm very mindful. I mean, just the topic that we're talk talking about makes it sound scary. By I do lots yeah. of episodes that have nothing to do with it <laughs> sounding scary. And I yeah. imagine that a lot of this information is kind of like, if all you listen to is this one episode, it would make it sound like birth is very scary. Yeah. And I'm sure that people are consuming this information. And I wonder if you're getting more clients that or patients that you see in pregnancy that are requesting C-sections you know, out of fear? Are you finding that? Yeah, so there's definitely been an increase. Yeah. So um, I would say there's, um, there's some um, uh, definitely fear, especially with the first time moms about pain during labor, about operative vaginal birth, about baby's health. I think they're just there's multiple things that they have fears of, that sometimes will push them towards having a elective C section. Um, so we get um, oftentimes uh, consultations from the primary uh, maternity providers uh, just for a consultation about motor delivery. So this is um, a, a common topic we'll talk about in our office. And then my job is to provide them with the different uh, pros and cons of the different options and for them to make a decision. And I would say it's not uncommon that I can convince people to give vaginal birth a try because, um, you know, if they're healthy, the baby is not really big, and there's no other reasons why there would be a problem doing birth, then um, I encourage people to give that a try. Because it's always if you're successful in having a spontaneous vaginal birth, that's still the safest for mom and baby and much quicker for recovery. I wonder, I'm shifting gears a little bit. And I it just made me think when we were talking about um, kind of the acute management after any birth, whether it be C-section or vaginal birth with or without forceps or episiotomy or vacuum, but that people will describe, you know, feeling sore, um, swollen. Um, also, too, they feel, you know, very vulnerable in their tummy, whether they've had a C-section or it just feels like a saggy balloon at the front. But I have a lot of mm -hmm. clients that will reach out in the acute phase postpartum, very nervous about that kind of heaviness in their undercarriage. And I'm curious if you ever, Mary, recommend compression garments, because that's something I've done some um, episodes on lately, because there's there's actually 
pretty good data to support compression after C-section and even some data to, you know, and, and the data basically says it's helpful for less pain, ease of movement, less nervousness, basically. And um, I think that's what most new moms feel is nervousness, hard time getting around on and off the couch, on and off the bed. And so I'm curious if you would ever consider recommending compression garments, almost like, you know, high-waisted, there's different medical grade or or um, companies that make good quality garments. Would that be ever something that you consider suggesting? Yeah, so it's a question that I get asked as well. So basically, my biggest concern is when people wear them too tight. Yes, uh, compression does help with pain after C-section. But when people wear them too tight, when the pelvic floor is very lax after um, any type of birth, I really want that tissue to start to heal, to start to go back to its original position. And um, because if we start compressing and putting pressure on them prematurely, my fear is that there's going to be more prolapse or incontinence in the future. But again, I want to emphasize, this is my concern. This is not study proven, right? Because mm -hmm. any type of study in the postpartum period is extremely difficult. I know there's some data, but how good is the quality of data? I don't know. Because I tried to study, uh, do the study on women postpartum after their vaginal uh, birth with a uh, anal sphincter injury, they're busy with the baby. They, mm -hmm. they, It's very hard for follow-up, right? So I think my biggest fear is, yes, you can wear them, but I don't re recommend wearing them too tight. Mm -hmm. um, some women feel like if they wear them really tight, the belly can shrink faster, mm -hmm. but that's that's not how what, what those garments are designed for. I no. think it's to support. So yeah. if they wear them too tight and the more pressure on the pelvic floor, I think that's not the good way to use it. Totally. I'm actually going to add a link in the show notes. I um, was sent like a sample from, there's a company based out of Australia that makes some really nice garments that feel really supportive from the bottom, right? In, in yeah. around the legs and the undercarriage. So yeah, it's cool. kind of um, a compression that's from the top and down, but it feels almost mm -hmm. bottom up compression um, mm -hmm. and they feel great. And so I think it's, it's very individual. Like you said, the goal is not to yeah. shape wear but more just yeah. helping you move around with ease so that you don't feel like you're you know uh, vulnerable down there yeah exactly I have another mm -hmm. question um let's say do you notice in the birth situation I have had a couple of labor and delivery nurses lately that have described to me that this is how they describe it. I can tell that there's some women that seem to do some work to know how to settle into the pain and work with their bodies and other women in the birth situation become very anxious. They are not managing the pain very well and they seem to have a harder time, maybe more chance of forceps, vacuum, getting tired. Do you... Would you say that you clinically notice a difference like in, in people that are able in some sort of preparation that they've done to, you know, to help them in the birth yeah. situation? Can you describe? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So basically, um, even in the, the guidelines from the SOGC, I know I keep referring to the SOGC, um, but that, that's the kind of the body of um, uh, guidance that uh, all the OBGYMs uh, look for um, in, in, uh, on any type of topics regarding birth. So they say, um, you know, diff uh, there's a couple of factors that, be, uh, that can promote a spontaneous vaginal birth. And the number one thing they said was a dedicated support person. Because that support person can help them breathe through the pain and tell them this is very normal. You know, you can do this. Just somebody that can encourage women. This is a very natural process. You know, work with me. Let's use different techniques to help manage the pain. Um, so this is one of the things that we definitely see can help women uh, cope better with the pain. And there's less interventions with birth and the birth go more smoothly. So mm -hmm. I definitely agree. Um, I can mention the other things that they recommended um, is that, um, you know, they also, also say when moms have no other risk factors, um, if we use something called intermittent auscultation versus the continuous monitoring of the baby's heart rate, those le also lead to less intervention because uh, intermittent auscultation means after every contraction, they have a listen to the baby, make sure the heart rate is okay. Versus the continuous monitoring means that they have to put them on the babies uh, on the monitor continuously. Of course, there are medical indications why the doctor may recommend that, but I don't think it's uh, it's good to, to to have that if there's no medical indication. 
Um, and then also um, they said that if any women have an epidural in place, it might be good to wait for a little bit of sensational urge to push before we start. So instead of pushing too early and then they can become exhausted. So those are some of the things that um, we can consider in, in labor to help to uh, promote a spontaneous vaginal birth. Mm -hmm. Do you even find too that kind of some movement in birth, like just encouraging people to move around or sometimes I tell people like, even if you feel like you're um, comfortable in a place or for whatever reason you can't move, like even just like jostling yourself or something between, between your contractions or between pushing just so that just give yourself another opportunity, another opportunity for the baby to come of course. That's one thing as physios, I think a lot of people associate us with kind of the postpartum care, but mm -hmm. we're starting to see more and more people in pregnancy that come in just saying, I'm here because I, I want to give my body the best chance. Mm -hmm. And essentially, I, in a nutshell, what, what we do, I always say, um, just like I pre-op people before open heart surgery or knee surgery, give you an idea of what's to come, but mm -hmm. um, help you understand the pelvic floor. This is a group of muscles we don't normally think about. And most people don't feel a sense of control over them, but learning mm -hmm. to visualize the muscles, how to feel the difference between them tightening and relaxing and help them understand that when you're in a fight or flight situation like birth or feeling pain or nervousness, you're going to have a tendency for tension that's normal, but helping them find cues and visuals to help them relax into that, whether it be focusing on the breathing or visualizing the pelvic floor opening or different positions they might feel more control in. And then also working with, I often get them to try different ways to push. What does it feel like to draw? I always say, we need to get a watermelon out of a donut, a flexible donut hole. And what are some ways we can mm -hmm. generate downward pressure while maintaining softness in the mm -hmm. pelvic floor? And, and I find a lot of people, um, I get them to practice that in pregnancy, just to give them a sense of a plan for um, how, mm -hmm. how you might be able to manipulate some of those variables and that you can push different every time, you know, but just learning to work with your body. And um, mm -hmm. I find a lot of people say that really helped. And I can imagine you mentioned at the beginning that one of the reasons that forceps or vacuum might be indicated is that someone's been pushing a long time and they're not making progress. And I can't help but think, um, if we've never done this before, how could, could how good could we actually be at it? Right. If we haven't exactly. kind of put some thought into it. Yeah. yeah. So it's, I totally agree. So it's, it's not uncommon where for the first, let's say half an hour, 45 minutes, we're just teaching the women how to push Yes. because you can see that they're trying, but um, the energy is just not going the right place. So then sometimes they're pushing into their legs. Sometimes they're pushing into, you know, their belly, but you need to push into your bum. So, so, and then once they get really get effective with the pushing, then that's when the progress are seen. Right. But by that time they, they wasted uh, their energy for about 45 minutes. They are pushing, but it's just the energy didn't go in the right place. So I think mm -hmm. it's, it is definitely helpful uh, when women can, can practice a little bit, but you know, don't, don't start really pushing at home when no. you're premature, <laughs> but it's just knowing where your pelvic floor is knowing, you know, how to focus the energy in that area if needed. Um, so I think that's going to be a definitely, um, going to be helpful, um, when the time comes for them to actually push. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I just do yeah. kind of like mindful pooping, you know, just like when you're on the toilet pooping, like just imagine what's going on. Cause it's gonna be similar to draw, yeah. drawing a baby down. Yeah, exactly. Um, can you, we, where I live in Kelowna, we do not have any specialty pelvic floor clinics. Um, I know bigger centers often do. So, um, will you just speak to that really quickly? What, um, talk to me a little bit about what is offered in the lower mainland as far as pelvic floor clinics, what do those even look like? So, because there are going to be, be people listening to this, that's unfortunately do have some lifelong symptoms or some persistent symptoms after an operative birth. So w where could they seek out help? In my community, we don't have such a thing. You have to find us and our individual clinics. But um, what are those pelvic floor clinics for? Yeah, so um, I'm actually glad you asked uh, because um, uh, myself and um, uh, another urogynecologist is actually in the process of creating this uh, uh, maternal pelvic floor clinic at BC Women's Hospital. Um, and um, these pelvic floor clinics are going to be multidisciplinary. So uh, we're going to have physiotherapists um, who's going to offer sessions for women who have uh, pelvic floor dysfunction after childbirth. 
um, as a, a um, kind of our role as the urogynecologist is to do the assessment to determine can this person's symptoms be treated with conservative therapy, which is working with the pelvic floor physiotherapist, or do they need more uh, medical treatment or even surgical treatment? Um, so this uh, clinic hopefully is going to be um, uh, up and running uh, this year. <laughs> so um, that's going to be a great place uh, to to see one of us. But for now, there are a f uh, quite a few uh, urogynecologists uh, who have a special interest in pelvic floor. So right now, it's unfortunately still just a individual referral. Um, I think uh, Dr. Maria Giroux is in Vancouver, who has a special interest. Uh, myself, uh, I am in New Westminster uh, out of Royal Columbia Hospital. Um, but unfortunately, the wait can be a bit long. So that's why we're hoping once we have these maternal pelvic floor health clinic established, we can get patients seen more quickly. And then of course, in our private clinics, uh, we don't have the uh, pelvic floor physiotherapists who are so important in this healing process. So then um, we're hoping that uh, we have we can provide the service to the patients uh, once the clinic is up and running. So if we if I kind of tie up a few messages, I think one, we are not looking to scare anybody because this is just about education. Our topic just happens to be talking about things that um, can feel nerve wracking, but our goal is not to create nervousness, but just to educate. And I think um, that um, birth isn't as simple as C-section, you're going to get exactly this and forceps, you're going to get exactly this, but just Im important to understand. And I think maybe have those, if, if your care provider's not bringing it up, ask questions. I actually, my first baby I had in Vancouver at, at BC Women's, and I was very thankful that my doctor asked me when I was pregnant, have you ever thought of forceps? What are your thought of forceps? And I remember thinking, geez, no, I guess I just thought I had to have them if I have to. I was very naive. And she said, well, not necessarily, but this is these are some things to consider if it is offered to you. And that really got me thinking. And of course, that came up and I had a forceps birth, um, but it helped me feel less nervous about it. And um, I always encourage my patients when they come in too to ha just ask questions. Don't feel stupid asking questions because you'd rather ask them now than um, in the middle of a stressful situation. And I know that we're limited as care providers, especially you as a physician and and the midwives and the the um, obstetrical physicians have a hard time kind of getting a lot of that in. But I think we're starting to see more information like this that you can kind of consume and listen and then ask your provider some specific questions. I think you're also saying to that, um, you know, just because you have some of these interventions doesn't mean that your life is going to be negatively affected. Um, mm -hmm. and that every single situation is different. There's when you're listening to information and research, there's lots of things that maybe they're promoting or saying, but there's a lot of factors that may not be included that are, you know, kind of behind the scenes, right. Or not being mentioned. Mm -hmm. Um, that kind of going in with a little bit of preparation and thinking about if it's your first vaginal birth, what do I need to do to like walk through this a little bit, practice certain things, be familiar with my pelvic floor so I can be more effective with managing pain and, and knowing what to do in this situation. So maybe I'm not up against that decision. What else, Mary, what have I not mentioned that you want to make sure that we get out of this conversation? Yeah, so um, basically, I think the main thing is the, um, I, the message I've kind of mentioned to all the people who ask me about vaginal birth is that um, really, there's a lot of things that we can control during the process. Um, going into your birth experience with an open mind, because um, if you have a very set idea exactly how your birth is going to be, you're going to come out the other end disappointed. Because sometimes, you know, mother does um, have different things that we can control. Baby have different things that just there's nothing we can do to change what what how they behave in birth. So I think it's just really to be prepared, be knowledgeable about your options, going into the birth experience, knowing that there's always a chance of intervention. It's not because the doctors want to intervene, it's because they want to ensure the safety for the mom and the baby. 
And when the intervention comes, uh, it's good to hear what the doctor's recommendation is because they know kind of what the clinical situation is and what is the best way to go. But when they give you the option to choose, let's say, hey, you have the option of going a C-section and a forceps, then exactly like you said, Melissa, knowing the risks and benefits and knowing what your preference is will help you make that decision at that time. But if the doctor says your baby's heart rate is really bad, you need to get this baby out, vacuum is the only way, please go with it because <laughs> this is going to be the safest way. So mm -hmm. it's coming from clinical experience. Correct. I think as you, as you were saying, as you were talking, I thought of one other thing that's, I think, important to know. And I hear this all the time. I'll, I'll have clients or patients that reach out that book an appointment with us as physios um, exactly at six weeks postpartum, because they heard that's when they can start their recovery. And I, and I coming from working in an acute care setting at Royal Columbian Hospital, I was very well versed with the idea that we see people after open heart surgery, brain surgery in the ICU after knee surgery, the day after they have procedures, and we are trained to know what to do at each stage of healing. I would never expect someone to do something that would compromise their pelvic floor or their C-section recovery acute. But I sometimes think, why do we would never wait to see someone six weeks after a knee surgery? Why do we tell people they have to wait six weeks? The things that I often would do with people in the acute phase after a traumatic vaginal birth or a C-section or even a vaginal birth that they describe as beautiful is just educate mm -hmm. around the importance of rest and um, potentially whether compression would be helpful. What can you do to start getting gentle connection with those muscles again? How do you poop easier? How do you pee easier? Um, how to lift your baby mm -hmm. without feeling so much pressure? And so we don't need to wait six mm -hmm. weeks to do that. And, and many of us will do those appointments online. So you don't need to come into the clinic, but there's a lot in the mm -hmm. acute phase to help with recovery. The goal is not strengthening or um, making you do hard things or get in shape, but more the same types of things we would do after any other type of surgery or procedure. And so I think that's one thing that a lot of new moms don't understand is that there's help for you before six weeks. Um, there's a lot mm -hmm. of moms at home that will describe, I felt really good and I overdid it. And now I'm kicking myself because I didn't have that guidance. Or some will say, I've been laying down for three weeks, terrified to move. I wish I would have had some guidance. And I don't think any new mom should be at home wondering what to do. And so I think that's another big plug for physio is you can reach out whenever you're ready um, and just yeah. find someone that's comfortable working in that acute phase. Um, because I think there's a mm -hmm. lot of fear and, and messaging that's, that you have to wait six weeks. Yeah. Yeah, I think the message, um, the reason for that message, because I think um, the, the, some of the providers uh, was worried that uh, as part of the exercises with the pelvic floor physio is that sometimes there's some hands-on sessions. And yeah. then um, oftentimes um, they don't want any manipulation of the vagina during that time. But like you said, it's just really about connection with, uh, with the patients and giving advice. So I think the message here is basically, yes, definitely connect with somebody if you are able to. Um, but um, I would say uh, don't do anything inside the vagina no. physically, just let it heal first because the stitches sometimes take about six weeks to to dissolve yes. but having that guidance knowing how to you know just even get regular bowel movements going peeing properly those are also super helpful mm -hmm. so there's not a, like a hard rule but i would say the only hard rule is don't let anybody touch your vagina until no. the doctor see you at six weeks and that's why I often do those sessions online so that they don't have the fear that I would, I would never do that in the first six weeks, but they don't know that. And so that's why I often say, you know, just email me after your baby comes and we'll talk about what we can do. Tell me how you're doing. And if you mm -hmm. feel like you're struggling, then we'll talk about it in through an online appointment, but absolutely no, there wouldn't, I don't see any reason I have to touch someone in that first six mm -hmm. weeks, but more just mm -hmm. educate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I really appreciate your time, Mary. I, I know you're a busy woman and have lots on the go. I appreciate every everything you do for this area. And, and um, I will look forward to connecting with you again in the future. 